Today we're going to be doing our workshop on research and medicine. And we have two student panelists here right now. And then we also have uh, uh, my personal PI who is Dr. Christopher Haas. He, uh, does research in, he does research in APK and he does a broad focus on biomechanics with a more focused basis on clinical biomechanics. And he's also an associate provost for the university. Um, and if you guys have any questions, you can go ahead and just start asking any of our panelists. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, let them introduce themselves also. I'll start with the student panelists and Anjali, you can go ahead and introduce yourself if you'd like. Hello, my name is Anjali. I'm a senior graduating with a degree in behavioral cognitive neuroscience. And I do research in the uh, pharmacology and therapeutics department. I'm the other student panelist. I'm Sofia Velasco and I'm a sophomore conducting research at McKnightbury Institute under the College of Medicine. And my focus on, my research focus is on neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and stroke. And I'm really excited to answer some of your questions today. And I hope that you learn valuable information from this workshop. And then Dr. Haas, if you wanted to introduce yourself, you could, I, I gave a small one, but if you just yeah, want sure. to give a little more. Oh, you, you did a great job. So uh, I hope to live up to what you said. So yeah, I'm Chris Haas, I'm a professor in applied physiology and kinesiology, but I, I'm also an affiliate faculty member in the Fixell Center for Neurologic uh, Diseases, um, as well as doing work in the My Brain Institute. Uh, our work focuses mostly on locomotion and balance disorders in older adults and patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, I've been involved in research from my time as undergrad uh, until now that I'm an old person. So certainly happy to share um, any experiences or advice um, or to answer any questions that you all may have. It's certainly a wonderful opportunity uh, at this, this university affords. And I know that uh, the students who've, um, who've been active in our lab have had a huge impact on the lives and on the research that we do. So it's a, it's a great win-win opportunity. And then if you guys have any questions, you can just go ahead and start asking in the chat or you can ask directly of any of our panelists. Um, so for the student, I have a question. How did you guys find your research? Angela, you wanna go first or did I go first? You can go, you can go. <laughs> so I found my research lab at the Kashubili lab of MBI through cold emailing, uh, quote unquote. So pre-pandemic, uh, before I, actually stopped foot on campus, I emailed some professors that I found to be interesting regarding their research. And uh, I did that by looking at the College of Medicine uh, Neuroscience Department, because I knew that I wanted to do research in that field. And after skimming through a couple of professors and researchers, I emailed them, asked them about their research and if they're taking any positions in the lab. Uh, that's how I did it. and. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions about that, or if you want me to be more specific, uh, let me know. I found my research position at the end of my freshman year. I was taking a neuroscience class and my professor was a pharma pharmacology um, researcher. So um, throughout the class and at the end of semester, he knew that I was interested in doing pharmacology research and he told me about the SURF program that UF has, which is the Summer for Undergraduate Research Fellowship. And I applied for that through the pharmaco pharmacology department and I got that. And then after the summer, I just stayed with the lab. And maybe I'll just add from, from my perspective of what's been shared so far, um, that's exactly how the majority of students get into my lab. It's either 
through interactions with myself or my graduate students. So either in a class that I've taught or, um, or a class that my grad students have TA. So that's one, because you kind of built a relationship with them and you've, um, you got that trust and then you're willing to, to, to go work in the lab. And the other is cold call. And we have uh, students who, you know, emailed me in the fall of their freshman year and stayed in the lab for four years. And so uh, you should feel totally comfortable uh, cold calling or cold emailing faculty. Um, what Sophia said was exactly great advice. So do some homework. So, you know, never ask people questions that are already answerable, like on their website or um, other places where you can Google them. So, you know, read their websites, do some research, look at their publications, their most recent publications via either Google Scholar or um, PubMed uh, or just Google in general. And then, you know, if, if, the, if that research paper sounds interesting to you, you know, what I like to see is, you know, dear Professor Haas, I'm interested in doing undergraduate research. Um, I read your paper on this and I just wondered if you're continuing that line of work or what opportunities you may have. Um, and then, you know, be persistent because we get dozens of these emails a month. And so, I mean, there is a little bit of luck and fate associated with it. So if you, if you emailed and didn't get a response, then two weeks later say, just want to reach back out to you again. I'm so interested in your work. And, uh, you know, you, it's, it's okay to, to press um, for those opportunities. And then, you know, participating in some of the research-based courses, you know, Science for Life, there's several research-based courses that expose you to different types of research on campus. And so, you know, if you go to a lecture, you go to, you see a sign posted in front of the MBI or in front of engineering or just pretty much any building has a seminar series. If you go to it and it sounds interesting, then just ask, um, you know, while you're there, this is really interesting because everybody doing research in this area here that I may be able to connect with. And the, the lion's share of faculty got into this because we like stimulating future scholars, right? And, and learning from you and, and taking your passion into the lab. So there is somewhat of an expectation that it's a, that this why, that's why they're here. And so you should feel comfortable and safe asking for those opportunities. To kind of piggyback of, of uh, Dr. Haas, did I say your name correctly? Haas, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So piggybacking off of what he said, I, I'd like to elaborate more on uh, the cold emailing side. So um, as he mentioned, you should be as specific as possible and relate your interest with the lab's interest and not just be like, hey, I want research. Do you have a position? Like, don't do that. Uh, in, the, in the friendliest way possible, please don't do that. Uh, what I did was that I read some of Dr. Bowie's <coughs> papers on methamphetamine research, and I reached out to her about it, asked if she is conducting any more research on that, because I was interested. And unfortunately, she didn't have any ongoing research on methamphetamine uh, <coughs> use, but she did have research on Parkinson's disease that was ongoing. And then I got, um, I still found it interesting, and uh, she set me up as a research assistant for that project. So... Um, just to reiterate, read and do your research, like Dr. Haas said, and cold email and don't give up. I emailed at least five people and only one responded. And I've heard people emailing 20 professors and only one responded. So it's both luck and persistence and uh, just keep pushing through and you'll, you'll eventually find a lab. UF is a huge school, so there is research, a research out there for you. And just to keep it will be a great team. We'll just keep piggybacking. Um, a couple of things to think about too, is that you want to differentiate yourself from the other 20 people who are cold emailing, right? And so, uh, you, what you, you really want to come across as you're not checking a box for something else, right? So we, we know when you got to, in your applications to UF, you knew you had to do all these certain types of things to be competitive. And so what we don't, what researchers don't want is to just be a checkbox on your path to some award or to some future situation. So we really want people who are passionate about research and answering questions and problem solving. And, and so you want, if you just do a little bit of the work um, that's been described so far, then you'll come across as somebody who's actually interested in it uh, versus somebody who's just wants to have something on their resume. Um,
So hopefully that helps. And then I guess also just to build off that, Dr. Haas, uh, what would you say is like the best way for someone to differentiate themselves um, in the email? And also, uh, especially just because of COVID right now, if someone was doing like an interview, what is the best way for them like to show their passion in that interview? Because they're obviously not able to like show everything in person. Right. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of, I mean, a lot of things to think through with this answer. So the, um, so one, spell my name right. Like, you know, uh, don't use the form email that inevitably you say I'm doing research in something else that I'm not actually doing research in because you've copied it from a previous email that you've sent to somebody else. So those are all ways to stand out maybe the wrong way. Um, taking a look at some of the papers and seeing, you know, asking an intelligent question where I was confused. I read this, you know, I'm really interested in how I can apply my degree uh, to real world situations or to real science questions. And I read this paper and I have a question about this, or I read this and it's really sparked my interest. Are you doing anything in this area? Or if you have your own idea, I've always, you know, I've taken chemistry three times, you know, this is my fourth chemistry course. And I've always wondered about X, are there any opportunities in your lab uh, that deal with it? Right. So it just shows like you've, you've reflected on something you've you've done a little bit of homework that you're you know mark can tell you there's not he's, he's had a different experience obviously because of covid and, and situations that are going on but like not all research is glamorous right and so like there's parts of it that are like monotonous and brain numbing and they're just as important as like putting the stimulator in a person's brain but they're not always as glamorous and so you have to like show the attention to the detail and show the curiosity and show kind of the passion for problem solving that goes with that versus just the, um, you know, I want something on my resume that looks glamorous. I work with Parkinson's patients, for example. The other thing like <clears throat> culture of a lab is hugely important and uh, how well everybody gets along, the way you attack problems, the, the ability to be criticized, constructively, the ability to take that criticism, to be able to give criticism, um, both up and down, right? So like Mark has to be comfortable. Talk. So like the way it works in my lab is like, it's kind of a higher system, right? So Mark and I, unfortunately, to COVID, we don't interact as much as we would in a normal situation. But, you know, Mark's got a graduate student that's really kind of assigned to him to be his supervisor and his mentor uh, with support of me. And so when they clash on things, right, they have to be able to have grown up conversations and the grad student needs to be able to say, Mark, hey, this is where I think you're missing the ball. And Mark needs to be able to comfortable to say, hey, when you say this to me this way, it makes me want to not come in tomorrow, right? Or it makes me not want to do my best work. So, you know, so it's really important, like through the interview process, that you're, it's two ways, that you remember this a two-way street. You're interviewing the lab because it's a lot of work and it's not always glamorous. So you have to actually want to fit into that culture. And then two, we're testing to see who you are and how well you fit in. And if you're, you know, overly needy or overly critical or overly loud or you know, just anything that like detracts, that add, takes away energy from solving the problems or, or working with the patients, that becomes problematic. Um, you know, we, pre-COVID, we would bring people in and make them problem solve in groups and we would say, okay, you know, try to, so based upon our research, this is the type of questions we ask, how would you do it right now? Without any tool, like without knowing anything about the lab or how, like, what would you, what is your approach? We just try to get a sense of like how you think and how willing are you to like listen to other people's opinions and then fight for your opinion. And so it's kind of like, you know, kind of a behavioral um, interview. So you, you have to be comfortable kind of like showing your whole self. Um, I have a question. I guess you applied to the whole panel. Um, how many hours are you expecting the student to like stay in the lab and how many hours are the actual student ambassador staying in the lab usually?
So Lisa, that's a question that you want to <laughs> ask in the interview for sure. Our general, yeah, we, we kind of base ours off of um, credit based, right? So one credit's three hours of work. Three credits is nine hours of work. Um, we generally try to have a minimum amount because just having you in the lab for one hour or just for three hours often isn't. By the time you're trained up, you're not that useful. So we do have a kind of a lab minimum, um, usually in that nine hour, um, six to nine hour range. You can, and that's if you're going to be like an official person in the lab, right? We do allow people to come in and kind of observe for a period of time to find out if that's, you know, if they really want to do this. And we do have some people that come in only for an hour per week, but we don't necessarily, you're, the less time you're there, the less you can learn and the less you can be a benefit to the lab. And so therefore, you know, you'll do less and leave with less. Whereas, I mean, I had, I've had many a freshman who start in the lab and by the time they're a senior, they're like running the lab. They have students under them. They're running their own experiments. Um, you know, they got their second round of uh, curbs funding. So it's, it all depends on what you can put into it. And then I guess for Sophia and Anjali, um, how often do you guys spend in the lab per week? Or, and I guess, uh, how has that changed like since COVID too? You can go first. Um, I think spending, um, like Dr. Haas said, a good six to 10 hours a week is um, preferred. I think that way you get a really good understanding of how things are working in the lab. And um, like you just get to understand like what the day-to-day -day is like and how you can contribute to the lab. And because of COVID, um, my lab hours have reduced just because of like how many people are in the lab. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, similar answer for me. I, um, Dr. Kushbui expects like more in the higher range of 10 to 15 hours in terms of range, but uh, projects fluctuate in, in terms of commitment. So Sometimes, uh, for example, uh, I, I, I've spent between three to 15 hours in the lab and, and that's mainly due to what I do. Uh, for example, uh, in the Parkinson's project I worked on, I came in the lab and helped with hands-on activities pre-COVID and I'll go home in my apartment and work on images and data analysis. Uh, during COVID nowadays, I, I still come to the lab and uh, there are social distancing measures and uh, et cetera. And um, I still do a good chunk of work at home. And I feel like there's not a, a specific answer for this question, just because each PI has a different expectation of their students. But as Dr. Haas and, and Angeli said, the more you put in, the more you get out. And that's not only with knowledge, but opportunities. So you can apply for USP, uh, Emerging Scholars Program, and my favorite, publications. So put the work in, get the grind in, and um, even with COVID and everything, it's still beneficial. And one last thing, I, ha I hate to drone on. Um, with COVID and everything, when you're looking for research, also consider working at home at first, like virtual data analysis, and then you can say to your PI, I would like to transition into an in-person position. Is this possible anytime soon? So you're kind of like wiggling your way into the lab. And uh, I think that's something you should consider with COVID. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, I'm a peer advisor for CURBS and part of our job is helping undergraduates find research. And one of the ways that we've been trying to encourage students to apply is by um, really emphasizing their um, ability to help with data analysis because that can be done um, remotely. And then once you kind of have that, um, like you establish a relationship with the PI, like Sophia said, asking if you could do in-person things and you know that um, 
you know, that's really situational, like depending on what year you are and how much time you have to devote to the lab, but it's definitely something to consider if um, that works for you. Yeah, and so just to kind of build on on that, and, and you know, the, we're, we're learning as PIs just as much as the students are learning how to work in a COVID situation and how to provide, well, and how to keep our research running and then two, how to provide educational opportunities and experiences for you in the lab. And so we, some of the things that, uh, you know, that, that I may look for now differently than I did before is certain skill sets, right? So in the data analysis side of things, you know, how comfortable are you with Excel? How comfortable are you with database management? Um, have you used MATLAB? Have you programmed in any language before? These are not necessarily requirements by any stretch. And some of the things that we, would, we could teach you, you wouldn't even you know, need to have any skills coming in. But if you have those skills, you would certainly stand out. Um, the same thing is true with like um, your ability to do, you know, kind of I'm gonna use quote unquote library based research, right? So if you know how to use PubMed or Web of Science to do literature searches, um, and to summer, if you learn how to summarize a paper, um, you know, it's almost impossible for a highly functioning PI to keep up with the literature as one person, right? And so by being able to say, okay, this week, I, from the keywords from the lab, I've searched PubMed or Web of Science, and here's three articles that relate to our work, and here's the summary, and I present them every Friday. Like, that would be huge for the lab and huge for you in terms of learning how to read the literature and, uh, and you know, in a good and a well supportive lab, we, we would not expect you to have the insights and the depth of knowledge to like critique things, but you could bring by bringing it to the table and, and having a conversation, opening up to a conversation in the lab, it's, it'll be a huge benefit. So the ability to, to research or to find research and then to, you know, summarize it in a meaningful manner. And there's, um, there are some courses that you have to you can, that teach you how to do that. Um, that you could take. And then other than that, like I know that, and feel free to, I'll put my email in the chat, but I have some documents on how to do that. So uh, you're welcome to them, but those are ways to be really effective in a COVID environment. And I think the other thing that would be beneficial just around that is that the worst thing that could possibly happen is you're interviewing for medical school or graduate school. And they say, what did you do in Dr. Haas's lab, and you can't speak intelligently about it, right? That means I failed you as a mentor, and it means you failed in the experience, right? So if you go, if all, so if you can only do data analysis, or you can only like, it's the only it's only a beneficial experience if you own it and can speak intelligently about it. And so, if you're as you're looking at labs, you want to make sure that that you know that the outcome is that you're really engaged in it and not just this hit, run, hit, run, hit, run um, person. Because it's, it's gonna hurt you in the end instead of helping you in the end. And does anyone actually have any questions? Um, just who's in the Zoom right now for any of our uh, students or for Dr. Haas? Well, I do have another question for Dr. Haas. What would you say is the best way for someone to advance their research once that they are within a lab? And like, what is the best way to either approach their PI or to approach the graduate students that they work with? Just showing that they want to go forward with their research and possibly like progress themselves. Sure, so one of the difficult things, and this answer really applies if you are a grad student in the lab too. Um, the, the lab only has so much time and so much resources to do kind of one-off projects, if you will. And so um, just you have to understand that it, the, the boundaries are limited and kind of like what can be done due to cost or time or use of resources. So for example, like in our lab, we use motion capture to collect body movements. And so we may be doing that with Parkinson's patients and 
that same technology can be used to say compare Nike running shoes to um, Saucony running shoes. And if you were in a lab that did running, that is happening all over the country. But if you were an undergrad and said, hey, I'm doing this up in the lab, can I do this study on these two running shoes? The answer is probably no, because it's just not a good use of our time because that's not the focus of our work. So you want to stay within the bounds of what you've seen. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you that almost every PI has, this isn't a sound insulting, so I don't hope it, 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 I don't mean it that way because there's still important research, but we have kind of throwaway ideas. So ideas that are good questions, but are not fundable by NIH or NSF or other agencies, but are just an interesting question that deserves an answer that will move the field for or provide knowledge to the field that's meaningful and useful, but isn't you know, groundbreaking or fundable. Those are great projects for talented undergrads and master's students. Because you, you're, it's not, it's a good, like I've already identified it as a good question. I've already, I'm already interested in it. And so if you just go to your PI or to a PI and say, hey, you know, I've shown you over the course of the last semester or last year um, that I'm competent in doing these things. I really feel comfortable with the task you've given me. I really like to make the next step. Uh, in my progression, I have some ideas of my own, but do you have any um, on your list of projects that are just waiting to be done that are, you know, at my level or that are, you know, that I could do, um, that I could do and will be the PI on? And the majority of faculty have those type of projects. And then also, <clears throat> we have mentioned, um, University Scholars Program, like that is a huge benefit to faculty, right? And so pairing your interest and passion with their idea or vice versa and getting it funded, looks, which is good for you, looks good for the faculty member. There's money available to help support you and the faculty members work. Like nobody's gonna turn down that pair. So again, it's just showing the initiative and saying, well, you know, What's the next question? Like, what's, and if, as you're working on a project, think about what is the next step in the question. So, if we found X today, what would follow up question be? And is follow up question something that you could do or want to do? I mean, it sounds like our two panelists have kind of started to do some of their own. You mentioned publications and that type of stuff. So, what has been your approach to get more independence? Uh, so I think I'm going to take it back of everything you said. Uh, I have really emphasized showing initiative and passion for your research. As, as cliche as that may sound, those are valued by PIs from a student perspective. And as Dr. Haas said, he values it. So um, I'd like to generalize that statement. Anyway, and uh, show passion by asking questions to your uh, PIs. Uh, I've moved on from the Parkinson's uh, project and I'm working on a Fragile X project, which is a genetic disorder. And uh, oh, I'm dealing with stem cell culture and data analysis as well, because you need both of those to you know, move forward with the research project. And uh, I ask questions about that topic, like what is Fragile X? Uh, what are the, the gen genetic components of it? How can you analyze data from these cells? And keep asking those questions and your PI may give you a mini project. In Dr. Haas's situation, he said uh, he would give like, a throwaway project in the nicest way possible as your own project, or you'll just be assigned that uh, specific section of that research and focus on that. So I'm focusing on the, the morphology of the cells and data analysis. And uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I could say more words besides <laughs> show passion, but that is the best answer I have in this situation. And I think, I, just to add that, the currency, and you mentioned this before, like the currency in scholarship is publications, presentations, and right, and ab abstracts and presentations. So if you, you know, go to undergraduate research day and every, co every college has one, go to the university level one, watch our scholars present their work. And, and if that resonates with you, then go back to your PIs and say, 
look, I, I want to own this. I want to be able to present this work. I want to, I want to be able to, I want to do the work to be on an abstract. I want to do the work to be uh, on a publication. We're, we're not going to turn you down. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I would be shocked uh, if anybody turned those statements down. I will back up Dr. Hass's statement. And yes, your your PI will most likely not turn you down. I recently uh, presented in the uh, Fall Curbs Symposium. I presented two posters on Parkinson's and a stroke project. It sounds like I'm talking about a lot of projects, but I, as I said, be passionate. Anyway, you're, ask your PI like, hey, I wanna present in this symposium. They will most likely say yes, because first off, they want to also advertise their project and collaborate with other researchers. Secondly, and they wanna see you grow as a researcher. Um, like I, there's motives and uh, you wanna go to medical school or you wanna go to uh, a PhD or whatever. Your PI knows that and they wanna support you. So that's why they uh, encourage you to apply to the symposiums, et cetera. Lastly, um, publications and uh, opportunities to be on a paper is also common. Uh, my first project will is provisionally accepted for uh, nature Parkinson's. So it, it literally just ask your, your PI questions ask for opportunities and you're set not to, not to, I hate to make that sound casual, but doctor, listen to Dr. Haas and ask us any questions regarding our experience as well. I just wanna add that I was really nervous to ask my PI to start doing presentations and making posters and getting involved in my own project. And I kind of just didn't know the best way to approach him. And just like Sophia said, the best way to do it is to um, be engaged, like want to learn more and be passionate. And your PI will see that and he will be, he or she will be more than happy to help you and support you on this journey. Once I asked my PI, he was very encouraging and understanding and I was nervous for nothing. So just wanted to point that out. One, la one last final addition, I promise. Uh, in the end, if, if they say no, that just shows, we'll maybe put more time in that research. If they say yes, you present at a symposium or write a, a paper, not only will that help you uh, improve on your, your research skills, but that will also prepare you for future interviews with medical school or graduate school or a PhD degree, wherever you want to go. Uh, for instance, um, helping... Uh, like presenting at the symposium from last semester, I feel so much more confident in articulating and describing my research. Whereas taking the back seat and just doing data analysis isn't that much beneficial in comparison. I can confidently say I can talk to a physician or a professional researcher about my project and I attribute that to presenting at a symposium. And in, in, in other words, it, presenting and taking advantage of these tangible opportunities will take you far in terms of research and future opportunities. I hate to sound repetitive, but everything goes full circle in research here. And I think that it's okay to be uncomfortable and to be nervous and shy about asking for opportunities. It's, we all were there at some point, um, but do know as both of our student panelists have said, it's a very high likelihood of success. And it's a very low, it, even though you're nervous about it, it's a very low risk ask because you wouldn't have said yes to work in the lab uh, and you wouldn't have stayed in the lab if it wasn't a supportive environment. And so we really do want you to grow in those areas and we will help support you in those areas. And as it's probably as foreign as some of kind of maybe the languages at times or the processes are at times it is very formulaic and so it's not like we teach you how to play the game so that you can play it versus we don't expect you to just go out in the field and play the game right and so um we're we're you know if you hate public speaking scientific presentations are not public speaking right it's it's a very constrained way of communicating and 
and we can give you the formula for how to do it. Like we'll train you in the way to do it, uh, where you can do it without anxiety and without the stress. And then, then once you've done that, then you'll find that it carries over into things like to be with interviews or class projects or other things because you you understand kind of the, the way to do it successfully. And uh, actually, doc, or another one of uh, the PI panelists joined us and Dr. Bennett. He is a professor with the College of Medicine and he's in the division of hematology and oncology. Uh, he received his PhD from Cornell and uh, he has a focus in cancer genetics and cancer biology. Um, Dr. Bennett, you can go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit. And then I guess just the first question would be, um, you have, like, what is your general uh, tips to students who are trying to do research in the College of Medicine? Yeah, I, I'm sorry I'm late. We had kind of a, a lab uh, crisis I had to take care of and help my lab tech with. And, um, you know, I, just to be brief, I want to just kind of leave you with two thoughts that I have. So I've had a lot of undergrads work in my lab, and I think persistence is, is key. Um, a lot of science is, per, is just never giving up. And, um, you know, you, you pick some people you think you'd like to work with and email them and try to go by and talk to them. But people aren't gonna be able to take you in, your, in their lab right away sometimes. But if you email them a couple of times or then you'll, then you'll be more on their radar. And um, you know, a lot of success is just not giving up. And so, so I, I think that's key for obtaining a research position uh, in, in, in the labs in the cancer center and things like that. And then we have a lot of students that are, are very ambitious and they apply for a lot of positions, like summer positions. Um, but I think you have to really balance that because it's almost better when you go to apply to graduate school or medical school to have a more complete project, a longer project in one lab where you can really talk about it and you've thought about it. Then getting three different internships at three different you know, universities so that you can kind of compile all these letters of recommendation. And so, so that would be my two pieces of advice. Be persistent and try to find something you love that you really like and, and focus on it for a year or two. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, and then I guess whenever those people are continually emailing you, like what is the best way and I guess this is for Dr. Haas also, at what point does it get annoying or what is the best way for it to not be, uh, because I know for a lot of students and like speaking for myself and probably a lot of other students, like I feel like if I email more than let's say, even if I double email or if I have to email three times, I feel like I'm just being incessant and that I'm not either getting my point across or uh, it's just unnecessary. But at what point does it, is it just the fact that uh, a lot of researchers don't have time and what's the best way to make sure that it's not incessant? I think emailing two or three times is okay. Uh, I don't know, I get a thousand emails a day, like seriously, a thousand emails a day. And I will see your email and sometimes think about it and not be able to reply to it. And so, you know, two or three emails is fine. And anything more than that, yeah, you might give up. I think the key is to kind of crafting an email a little bit okay i'm old i like to see correct pronunciation you know, spelling i like to see a couple sentences about why you're interested in working in my lab uh you know you know so you so craft your email a little bit um to to the person you're interested in working with that'll help and you know you just don't take it personally if, if you don't get a reply after two or three times just move on to the next person on your list of, of labs you'd like to go work in. But I think a couple emails are fine. I, I, I agree completely. And I, I think another strategy too is the timing of it. Like don't email me in the first week of January and say you want to do something in January or you want to do something in the spring term because that ship has sailed months ago. Um, and so, you know, uh, right now I'm probably full for summer. Um, and looking at the fall. So knowing kind of that it's a long haul and not an immediate 
scenario is is useful. So if you're reaching out in January, say, you know, next semester or this summer, or um, that opens the, that that makes me think that you've done your homework and have thought about it. And then two, I don't respond today. Then I know that you're on my it's on my radar that I need to talk to this person at some point. <laughs> And so that reminder email comes, it's like, oh, thank you for responding back because I've been meaning to talk to you, but it, you're, you know, in that queue of 2000. But... Yeah, for sure. Following up on that, what do you expect students to add in the emails? What do you want to see in the emails that we send them? A good email to me, I think, is introduces yourself, what year you are, what major you are, um, and maybe a little bit about why you think my research is interesting. Like, oh, I, I looked you up online and I see you studied, you studied this. And, and that's really intriguing to me because in my class, I really like this that we talked about. Um, you know, I always, and even if you work in my lab, we try to like link some of your classwork to what you work on in, in the lab. And um, so that's, that's sort of how I'd craft it. Yeah, There's no I'm, right or wrong way. A lot of people, people write a lot of different emails to me. And I like it too when you use your own words to describe my research and not just cut and paste from the lab website. Because my guess is you don't understand what those words mean because it's not written for you. <laughs> like, uh, so having like either from reading a paper or you know your interpretation of those words, I think uh, is helpful too. And then any past research experience or skills you know i've presented the science fair or i've done uh, literature searches or i'm proficient in matlab or excel or powerpoint or just anything that might again just pique my interest or help move you from the other emails that look a lot like look a lot like and for me i mean i'm a little by i do medical based research right and <laughs> it's sad or it's, maybe it makes me sad a little bit but like 99 percent of the undergrads go to medical school that work in my lab right they don't i don't turn them into phds uh, but when you tell me up front you want to go to medical school i hurt a little bit <laughs> so if you tell me that you you know you're passionate about understanding you know difficult questions and or helping people or that type of stuff that resonates more with me than I'm hoping to be the medical juniors medical honors program next year and your lab's a checkbox that I need. Right. Yeah, we're definitely looking for an email else that's a little bit more than hey, I'm gonna need a letter of recommendation next year. Can I work in your lab? You know, something something a little more than that, deeper. And I guess, you know, and just looking at the names in, in the group too, it's like, you know, we, there's not a better time to be in science and to be doing research. It's as inclusive and as equitable as it's ever been. And people are paying more attention to that than they ever have. And so, um, you know, take advantage of this opportunities that are placed uh, in front of us now. The some of the barriers, whether they be implicit or explicit, that might have been there in certain disciplines, I think the, the bright light is on them. And so um, the opportunities are there and people are working harder than ever um, to, to bring in diverse thought, diverse cultures, uh, diverse experiences into their labs. So. Well, uh, I feel like we've covered just about all the bases. And if, if anyone has any additional questions, uh, you guys can go ahead and speak up or say anything in the chat. But uh, if the panelists or anyone has any closing remarks or anything uh, left they want to say, then uh, we'll probably wrap up after that. I guess I'd, I'd like to provide a condensed run through of everything we went through because there was a lot of information, which it, it's research, it's a lot of things. So 
Um, if you're still looking for a research lab, I'm assuming you attended, so you're curious about research in medicine. Uh, after this meeting, I recommend looking through uh, a, a department list of researchers you're interested in working with. So for me, it would be Department of Neuroscience. So look through professors that you're interested in working with. Read, up on, read over their research and uh, papers, and some of the words may be intimidating, but try your best to digest it and turn it around and see and say, I don't know much about this, but I'm interested in it. I'd like to do research on this. It's kind of like flipping the, I don't know the terminology, but you know what I mean. And after reading on papers, craft an email. As Dr. Bennett and Dr. Haas said, your emails could make or break your application to the lab. So write a passionate email, talk about their research and why you'd be a great contributor. And after that, it's a waiting game. After two or three emails, move on to the next person. It's okay. Not everything is meant to work out perfectly. Repeat the process until you're content. And that's my final advice for this panel. Thank you. Uh, Miley, adding things to, and I feel like I'm going to bring her on the Sophie on the road with me for any of these type of talks. Uh, is don't settle. Right, research is hard, and you have to be in a supportive um and educational environment so if it feels wrong or it feels bad don't take it just so you can have something on your resume um it's it's failure is a huge part of what we do and you have to be able to embrace it and the only way you can embrace it is by being with a group of people who uh care about each other and, and care about the projects that we're doing so um it's far worse to have something on your resume that was a bad experience than it than not having it on there at all. So there's a there's a lab out there for you. Interview them just like they're interviewing you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for taking the time to come for our workshop. I'm gonna send out a follow up survey. So everybody who attended, thank you. And can you share that? Thank you, everyone. And then Thank also for, for everyone, uh, after you fill out that uh, final survey, um, we're going to have this recording posted on the CURBS website. So if anyone uh, wants to go back and just refresh their memory on anything that they heard, um, they can just go ahead and rewatch the video. Uh, that should be posted within the next few days and that should be it. Thank you, Dr. Ha, Sophia, and, uh, Dr. Bennett and Anjali uh, for all of the helpful information and hope everyone has a good day.